Hello, my name is David Broussard, and welcome to the Office 365 Bootcamp. In this episode, we'll be talking about Exchange Administration in Office 365. So let's pop over to the Admin Console and see what we can do with Exchange Administration. In the Admin Center under the, ad, under the Admin uh, Consoles, I can click on the Exchange link and it will open up the area where I administer Exchange. This is the same thing you would do if you were an on-premise Exchange, but now it's all through a web interface. I start with my dashboard where I can get to anything, but we'll go through each thing in sequence. The first thing I can do is I can actually, from here, I can manage mailboxes, I can manage groups and resources and contacts, and I can even manage my migration from here. Here's where I can do things like set up aliases, uh, I can set up additional mailboxes for people, um, I can disable uh, Active Sync and disable uh, Outlook Web Access for people, um, for each individual user. I can also go into the organization, and the organizational sharing allows me, allows me to determine who can share their calendars with people outside of the organization. So in the first area, I can say at an organizational level, can we enable free, busy, and other calendar information sharing between federated exchange organizations? So in other words, if I'm federated with your organization, I could actually set it up to enable you to be able to see my free, busy in, uh, in, uh, information so that when you try to schedule a meeting with me, you'll see when I'm actually in a meeting, when I'm tentative, when I'm out of the office. Uh, we can also allow people to share individual calendar information and contacts with external organizations uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the bottom area. Some of the protection areas that we've got that come with Exchange are actually pretty powerful. The first thing you get is an out-of-the-box malware filter. The malware filter that you get allows you to go out and set up if what to do when emails come in that are identified as actually having malware associated with them. For example, I can delete the entire message or I can delete all the attachments and give some default alert text, or I can delete it and give some custom alert text. So if a virus or, some, or a Trojan or something like that is sent to somebody, I can actually go ahead and make sure that, that, is, that the entire message goes away, or I can let the person know they got the email, but let them know that there was malware associated with that email and make sure that they're, therefore they're not bringing bad packages inside of our organization. I can also go down here and turn on this feature to block common attachment file types. So, in, so make sure that somebody doesn't send, oh, I don't know, uh, INI files or app files or exe files, things that I'm worried about that can commonly be used to infect people's computers. Uh, I can go ahead and block those. And if I turn that on, then I can actually say, what do I want to do? So if I were to actually turn this on, I can manage the file types that I block, and I can also decide, whom do I want to notify when there is an undelivered message because of this? Is it the internal sender or is it external sender? So I can actually so notify if somebody gets an email that's been blocked, I can let the people know who got that email that the email was blocked. Additionally, I can send an administrative notice to somebody to notify the administrator that there's been something that's been undelivered. Um, and so they can, and whether it's internal senders or external senders, and I can even customize that notification if I really want to. I've also got the ability to use a connection filter. A connection filter is going to allow me to select IP addresses that I'm going to allow to connect to Exchange. This can be used to prevent people from getting to your Exchange on your Exchange services from outside of your organization or from outside of certain uh, areas of the country. So if you know there are bad IP addresses out there, you can block those IP addresses or you can only allow certain IP addresses to get to Exchange. There's also a spam filter that comes with Office 365. In this case, what happens is I can go out and configure what I want to do when spam comes in. Do I want to move it to the junk email folder? Do I want to add a header to it? Do I want to prepend something to the subject line, like the word spam? Do I want to redirect it to a different email address so that, it's, so that it doesn't go to the individual user? Do I simply want to delete or quarantine it? Okay. Um, I can also grab bulk emails right, that are being sent out and classify them as spam as well. And you can have a threshold which decides from one to nine, with one being the most bulk email being blocked and nine being the least bulk email being blocked, you can set that threshold as to how much bulk email you want to allow through your organization. And if it goes into the quarantine, if it goes into the quarantine, how long do I keep it there? In this case, 15 days. I can also set up block lists that will always mark email from, from senders as spam and from even domains. And I can do the same thing with allow lists as well. Thus, I can whitelist and blacklist people. 
Um, and at the advanced level, I can actually go out and set up things like my image links to remote sites. So in other words, if I'm getting an email and it has an image and that, email, that image is linked to a site that's not the same place it's coming from, I can increase that spam confidence score, uh, which, would, which would make it more likely for me to block the email that's coming in. And there's a whole bunch of these kind of settings that I can go through here that are looking at you know, how much of my stuff is coming in in HTML, am I getting SPF records, um, all these different things can be used that you can customize to determine how you want to let spam in or outside of your organization. Um, I can also track outbound spam. So if I've got an email that's going out of my organization, I can track what's going out and then I can limit my chances of actually having it uh, tagged to spam. I can go into my quarantine center where I can actually go ahead and find emails that have been blocked or quarantined and I can do something with them. Um, and I can also see what accounts are currently impacted by the protection system. So if I've got somebody who has had emails that are going out that have been quarantined or they're, getting, they're, they're sending out malware, I can actually watch that and, and deal with them there. And then lastly, I've got the ability to set up my DKIM, which is going to make my emails to be more secure. It, it, it is a way of setting an encryption package uh, or a sort of... Um, a signature to my domain that makes sure that when, when people are getting emails that it actually, it actually asserts that it's actually coming from the domain that it says it's coming from. And this is to prevent somebody from spoofing a domain. I can also track advanced threats. So what I can do is actually look at safe attachments and safe links. And so as an example here, if I were to create a safe attachment um, policy, I can go ahead and give it a name and description, and I can choose what do I want to do when attachments come in, right? So if I've got an attachment that's coming in, and I want to, and I, I want to monitor it, I can say, you know what, it, the attachment will not be scanned for malware, or I can monitor it, so I'm going to continue delivering the message, but I'm going to track the scan results, or I can block it or replace it, uh, or I can deliver the message without the attachment and then reattach it after the scan has been completed. So this is allowing us to actually track these things in, in real time. So uh, I, when I get it, when I, I can redirect this attachment on detection to a specific recipient, thus enabling me to actually watch what's actually happening in there. An example of how we can use this is to redirect it to some place where I can do what's called a detonation chamber, where I can open it up inside an environment and make sure that this is actually a legitimate attachment and not something that's harmful to my organization before I actually allow it to go out there. I can do the same thing, by the way, with safe links, where I can actually go out and identify links, and if I turn this on, URLs will be rewritten, and they'll be checked against a safe link list uh, to make sure that someone is not clicking on a link and going out to, and, and having something bad happen to their computer. The next thing we can track is the actual mail flow. Now, earlier we talked about the ability, in, in another session we talked about the ability to go out and create rules in data loss prevention. Things that looked at things like social security numbers and like ABA routing numbers and account numbers. What those are actually creating are what are called exchange transport rules. And what they're doing is they are looking at documents that are out here and they're setting up sessions. So for example, have this US financial scan. What this is actually doing is it's looking for a specific piece of information. It says it's looking for a, a low count of one and it says if it contains any of the sensitive information, US bank account number, do the following, notify the sender with a policy tip, generate the incident report, and send it to the, the administrator. So what's happening here is those things that I created in the Security Compliance Center, they're actually creating these rules. And I can actually create even more rules if I want to. And if you see down here, I have these ones that like this allow override rule. What is this actually doing? Well, it's actually saying that if it gets an email back in and the subject includes the word override, then it sets the message header to override it, to be overridden, and allows the email to go out. And that's, if you think about the policy that happened before, when we set up a, a, a DLP, a data loss prevention, an email is sent, it identified that it had a credit card number in it, we sent an email to the manager or the administrator, that administrator said, yep, there's a, really there's a real business reason for that, I'm going to go ahead and say override, and that email coming back in is going to set that uh, original email to be allowed to be sent out by the organization. From here also I can actually trace uh, messages inside of my system. So by going inside of here I can actually say and by where do I want to trace what has happened to specific emails. This happens a lot when you're trying to find out what happened to an email. I can also have domains that I accept email from 
and domains that are uh, that from a remote area that I'm allowing people to come into and accept emails from. For the mobile device access, I can actually go ahead and enable the active sync se settings. So this is what enables me to actually go out and allow people to synchronize their phones with the email. Uh, as we get into the uh, enterprise mobility services aspect of this, there are advanced settings that let me actually uh, restrict what things people can do inside of uh, this particular, um, when, when they connect their email. For example, we can say, I'm not going to let you use the Apple email client. I'm only going to let you use the Outlook email client. Um, and I can do things like remote wipes and as well. When I look at the public folders, this is where I can actually manage my public folders and my public fo folder mailboxes. And, I, when I, and on mobile device uh, mailbox policies, what I can do here is I can actually go out and set up what are some things that I allow people to have from a mobile device? So if I'm going to allow people to connect to my network, in this case, I don't require a password on the phone. So if I require a password on the device, I can, I can decide, is it a simple password, meaning just a couple of digits, or am I going to require an alphanumeric password, a more complex one? Am I going to require the device to be encrypted for me to allow them to actually have email on the device? Am I going to say, how many pass, how many pa what's the minimum password link I'm going to let them have? the number of sign-in failures before the device is wiped. All of these things are policies that I can require a user to accept before I will let them actually collect their mobile device and get corporate email on their system. Lastly, down here, you can actually go down and set up a hybridized environment. This works a lot of times when we actually often set up hybridized environments because that's the way we want to start. You have your on-premise exchange email, we set you up in a hybrid environment, and your mail flow starts coming in on your on-premise email and then goes out to Office 365. Eventually, your email will go to Office 365 and some mailboxes may still be on-premise. We can route the email either way. Uh, a hybridized environment allows you to move your accounts between an on-premise and a, and a, um, a cloud-based residence and the user doesn't even actually know where they live. They don't care where they live at that point in time. And it makes the whole process of getting you moved from an on-premise out to the cloud much easier. Well, I hope this has been helpful. Thank you very much.